My name is Jim Fleming, and this is Our Sunday School. Our Sunday School is part of Stewart Heights Baptist Church in Chattanooga, Tennessee. To prepare for this lesson, please go to OurSundaySchool.com for a copy of today's handout. Now, let's get to this week's lesson. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Our Sunday School. I'm glad you're able to be with us this morning. And uh, happy Mother's Day to those of you to whom that applies. Hope you're having a great day so far. And uh, <clears throat> someone uh, made you breakfast in bed or brought you coffee or did something that was helpful this morning or maybe let you sleep in for a second. So there's that. I want to have a special welcome to those of you that are uh, live with us this morning. So thanks for being there. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to our special guest, Miss Amy Velosen. And uh, she has been teaching for us in, uh, uh, on Mother's Day now for, I want to say, at least 10 years, Amy. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's about right. I, I went back and looked at my records, and 2011 was the earliest one that I could find. So, um, so welcome again, and happy Mother's Day to you. And uh, I'm excited about Mark chapter 12 today. So, Thanks, guys. Good morning, and happy Mother's Day. I can't believe this is my third lesson in Mark. I even questioned this, thinking there's no way this is my third. But I taught Mark 2, 4 through 11, and Mark 7, 17 through 23. Every time I've taught, I've hoped for different verses, something that would be easier for me to talk about, focus on, teach on. And these verses are no exception. The parable we will be focusing on today has been rattling around in my brain for almost a month now. <clears throat> But as always, my God knows what I need and what I need to hear. I love that God uses my indifferences and quite frankly, my unwillingness to continually teach me new things. For those of you who are new to this class, like Jim said, I have been teaching on Mother's Day for about 10 years. I will say that I teach differently than Jim and it may have taken me a lesson or two or five to realize that that's okay. I do more of a talk while still focusing on the undeniable truths that are set forth in our verses. I am honest, sometimes brutally honest, about my thoughts on the verses and how they impact our lives and how we need to incorporate them into our lives. Also, in absolute honesty, I will admit that it's hard to work on a Sunday school lesson when you have bitterness and anger in your heart. Because when you do, the words that you are forming are not your own, or are your own and not God's. It is much easier when your heart is clear that you are fully able to focus on what he wants to tell you. My prayer for you all this week has been that we have open and clear hearts and minds for today's lesson. One can easily read these verses and think that they don't relate to us or try and push them off because they seem too hard to understand. I pray that God reveals truth to all of us and that we have, and that he be, we will not turn a blind eye or a hard heart against anything. I pray that through his word, his greatness will be revealed. With that said, let's dive into Mark 12. As we read, please remember our weekly question. What is God doing in you and through his word from the portion of Mark that we have studied so far? Mark 12. And he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and, and dug a pit for the wine press and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season came, he sent a servant to the tenants to get some of the fruit of the vineyard. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty handed. Again, he sent to them another servant and they struck him on the head and treated him shamefully. And he sent another, and him they killed, and so many others. Some they beat, some they killed. He still had one other, a beloved son. Finally, he sent him to them, saying, they will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. And they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What will come of the owner of the vineyard? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read this scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. 
this was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And they were seeking to arrest him, but feared the people, for they perceived that he had told the parable against them. So he left him and went away. And they sent to him some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians to trap him in his talk. And they came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances, but, to, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, Why put me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And they brought one, and he said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. Jesus said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. And Sadducees came to him, who said they were, there was no resurrection, and they asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife, but leaves no child, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. There were seven brothers. The first took a wife, and he died and left no offspring. And the second took her and died, leaving no offspring. And the third likewise. And the servant left no offspring. And the seven left no offspring. Last of all, the woman also died. In the resurrection, when they rise again, whose wife will she be? For the seven had her as a wife. Jesus said to them, Is this not the reason you are wrong, because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God? For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as far as the dead being raised, have you not read in the book in Moses, in the passage about the bush, how God spoke to them, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not God of the dead, but of the living. You are quite wrong. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, asked him, Which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, The most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and there is no other beside him. And to love him with all the heart, and with all understanding, and with all strength, and to love one neighbor as oneself, is much more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus said, saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. And as Jesus taught in the temple, he said, How can the scribes say that the Christ is the Son of God? David himself, in the Holy Spirit, declared, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself caused the Lord, so how is he son? And the great throng heard him gladly. And in his teaching, he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in law robes and like greetings in the marketplace and have the best seats in the synagogues and other places of honors at feast, who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. And he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums and a poor widow came and put in two copper coins, which make a penny. And he called his disciples and said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Where we are at the start of chapter 12 is the third time that Jesus has entered the Jerusalem and the temple since the start of chapter 11. Jesus may have only been in Jerusalem for a short time, 
but he had time for a few lessons along the way. All of this happened over a span of just a few days. Let's take a few steps back to examine what happened in chapter 11. The first time he came to Jerusalem was just after he was on the donkey and the crowds were shouting Hosanna. Mark 11:11 11, 11 says he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the 12. He walked around, he looked around. This really is, he came, he saw, he left. The second time he enters is 11:15, And they came to Jerusalem and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the table of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. Jesus takes charge of what is happening in the temple for they are not doing what the temple is intended for. And side note, if the thought that Jesus turned the tables has never crossed your mind, think on that. Trust me, I have been. He not only turned the tables in the temple, but in history, the world, my life, and hopefully your life. Now this concept of turning tables may, mark your, may make your head hurt for the next several weeks, and if it does, you're welcome. First Mark eleven twenty seven. It starts out with, and they came again to Jerusalem, and he was walking in the temple. The chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him. The first time he came to Jerusalem, he looked. The second time he acted, and the third time he was confronted by the scribes and the elders. He was asked, by what authority are you doing these things? And Jesus, per usual, returned their question with a question asking them about the baptism of John. They answer with, we don't know. And Jesus says, then I won't tell you either. Chapter 11 ends there. And I love that chapter 12 starts with, and he began to speak to them. He said he won't answer their question, but he breaks out this parable, which basically tells them the authority that he is under. Like usual, I started preparing for this lesson by just reading the verses over and over and over again. Knowing what Jesus had just done and that the cross was awaiting him, these verses, this parable, should not be surprising. Yet I was in a little of awe that Jesus was so direct in his own sort of way. Should I have been surprised? Well, no, because his directness is always on time. It's always much needed and stated in exactly the way he intended it. I also like to look up the verses to get a feel for what others, Christians, and even some non-Christian sites think about them. In this case, I also asked some family and friends for their opinion, and we'll dig into those thoughts a little later. One place I read entitled the verses for Mark 12, one through seven, Jesus debates authorities, which this kind of made me smirk because I don't really agree. In my opinion, in order to debate, there needs to be two parties in the conversation. And this was solely Jesus. So let's dig in. And he began. To me, this should really be, he continues. Because we have to remember these verses pick up at, like we already talked about, where Jesus has been talking to the religious leaders. And they had just asked him what authority he is under to do these things. And he began to speak to them them, meaning the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders, in parables. Parables are a fictitious narrative of common life, conveying a morale. The word parable is used 13 times in Mark. A man planted a vineyard. These were common sites in this region. Some sites I read called them the backbone of the economy. A man planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a pit for the wine press and built a tower. All of the work for this vineyard was done by this man, the owner. All the preparations were done by him. The fence is used for protection. It's used to separate it from other land and to keep all other little critters out. The wine press is what is used to press the grapes. The tower serves three purposes. It is used as a lookout post for the workers to give shelter to the workers, and it is used to store the tools and the seed that is used for the vineyard. And built a tower and leased it to tenants 
and went into another country. The tenants here are land workers, farmers, those that have been hired to care for the land while the others are away. The tenants were entrusted to care for the vineyard that the owner had already spent time cultivating. The owner of the vineyard had already done everything. He built the tower, he dug the pit, did all of the digging, the planting, the building, everything. The tenants really have nothing at stake. They were solely entrusted to care for it and to pay a certain part of the proceeds as the rent and the rest of the profit was theirs. Verses two and three. When the season came, he, meaning the vineyard owner, sent a servant to the tenants to get from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. And they took him and beat him, meaning to scourge or to thrash, and sent him away empty handed, meaning empty, nothing. The vineyard owner is only asking for, for a small part from all that is his. The tenants react with nothing but evil in their hearts. Verses four and five. Again, he sent to them another servant and they struck him on the head and treated him shamefully, meaning to maltreat or render infamous. Note the treatment got worse. The actions of the tenants escalated. They beat the first one and severely wounded and treated shamefully the second. And he sent another and him they killed. Again, escalation of treatment. And with so many others, some they beat and some they killed. The vineyard owner here is extremely patient. He sent another and another and again another. And there were many others. He had the same hope of getting something from the tenants each time he sent a servant and always got the same result, <coughs> evil. The loyalty of the servants to this man is astounding. They had to have known the situation, what had happened previously, and they still would go when he sent them. <coughs> Jim always includes the verb tenses on our handouts. And there for a while, he would always ask me what the imperative meant, which is a command because a previous lesson I taught had a ton of imperatives. We must note that the tense of sent here in these verses is the indicative, which is used to make a factual statement. It is a fact that the servants were sent, but not a command to be sent. They were loyal to the vineyard owner, so they went. That alone should make us pause. Verses six through eight. They still had one other, a beloved son. Finally, he sent him to them, saying, they will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. And they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. The vineyard owner saved the best for last. Pay real close attention to that. We do not know how many were sent. The verses just say many others. What we need to notice is that the vineyard owner was patient. He could have sent authorities or gone himself and rightfully claimed what was his. And two, his servants were obviously love and respect him. They kept obeying and going one after another. Remember, there were many others knowing full well what could have happened to them. And three, he saved his son, his beloved son, for last. Here, the word come is the imperative, commanding, let us kill him. The tenants were shamefully hopeful that by killing the son, they would be automatically get the inheritance. Verses nine and 10. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy and give the vineyard to others. This is the clear representation of the fulfillment of the establishment of Christ's church and its leaders. Destroy here is also the indicative, which means it is a fact that it will be destroyed. In verse 10, have you not read this scripture? He is talking to the proclaimed leaders and elders who should have read and understood the scripture. 
Have you not read the scripture, the stone that the builders rejected? Builders back then would typically reject stones that were not perfectly straight. The builders rejected and has become the cornerstone. Verse 11, this was the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. The scribes, the priests, the elders had rejected Jesus and God started anew with Jesus as the cornerstone. The cornerstones were critical for the structure and the stability of these buildings. The building with Jesus, who was the cornerstone that they rejected, is now the cornerstone for God's plan. God's work is marvelous and it is far beyond our understanding. Verse 12, and they were seeking to arrest him, but feared the people. For they perceived that he had told the parable against them. So they left him and went away. In the message translation, verse 12 states, they wanted to lynch him then and there, but intimidated by the public, they held back. They knew the story was about them and they got away from there as fast as they could. It should not surprise us that Jesus used a vineyard as the setting. He took what the listeners were familiar with. I guarantee you it did not surprise the listeners. For those religious leaders knew imme immediately that this parable was for them. They were the tenants, or some translations use the term husbandmen. They were the ones who did not give the portion of fruit back to the owner. They mistreated his servants and killed his son. The vineyard owner here represents our God, who is extremely patient with us. He gives us time and time again to come to him, to turn, repent, and act in love and obedience. And yet, time and time again, we respond with evil. I am sure that we have all had those moments where God pricks your heart. Something is said in a sermon or in Sunday school or by even a dear friend that directly points to the sin, to the error in your life, to the way that you have been living, to the way that you have not been walking as you should. April 11th's lesson from Jim had a moment like that in there for me. He mentioned paying more for pigeons. It was in reference to how we are putting up walls and forcing others to change out money, all in regards to what we are doing that would hinder others from worshiping God. This, I tell you, hurt. I have been forcing others to pay more for pigeons than I realized. This parable should have been one of those moments for the scribes and the elders. However, instead of acting in repentance, it only stirred their hatred for Jesus. They knew, they knew this parable was directly pointed at them, pointing directly to the fact that Jesus is the Son of God and they will kill him and throw him out of the vineyard. While they were plotting how to trap him and how to take him down, it says in verse 12 that they feared the people, the crowd, the spectators, those are the ones they didn't want to offend. They knew this parable was about them and still they didn't repent. No repentance, just silent hatred. While this may seem crazy to us, we must ask ourselves how many times we have done the same thing. How many times have we kept our mouth closed because we feared the people just on the opposite side? If someone speaks out against Jesus and the crowd backs them up, how many times do we fear the crowd and stay silent? I mentioned at the start of the lesson that I reached out to several people about these verses to get their thoughts and opinions. The first person to respond was my daughter, Grace. And there was a sentence in what she sent me that I have been thinking on ever since. She said, he sent Jesus, even though he knew he would be killed too. I'm gonna repeat that. He sent Jesus, even though he knew he would be killed too. So simple, yet so, so profound. Yes, 
God knew what would happen, and he willingly sent his son. Jesus knew what would happen, and he willingly came to save. Remember, the word sent was an imperative, a fact, not a command. Jesus had to be killed. God knew this. Jesus knew this. Those scribes, priests, and elders, though, they thought that Jesus' death was the answer. They thought that his death, the death of the vineyard owner's beloved son, would solve all of their issues. Well, his death did solve all of our issues, just not in the way that they had planned. I so look forward to the slow walk that we will be taking in Mark through the death and the resurrection of Christ. How lucky we are to have a God that loves us so much that he sent his beloved son. My mom sent me this quote from her study Bible regarding these verses. This not only speaks volumes concerning the patience of the father in sending servant after servant and warning after warning, but also concerning the stupidity, the stupidity of man who thinks that because God must be off in some corner of the cosmos, he need not listen to his servants. He need not reverence his son. He can do whatever he wants. Mankind makes mistakes the patience of God for impotence. But when he comes, judgment will fall upon those who have not revered his son. So clearly did the priests, scribes, and elders get the point of Jesus' parable that they knew he had to be done away with. As we have already said, this parable was pointed at the scribes and the Pharisees, and they knew it. But despite warning after warning, servant after servant, they were still more concerned with their appearance and their so-called lofty status than their repentance. Remember, verse 12 tells us that they were afraid of the crowd. They were more concerned about themselves than allowing the parable's meaning to take hold of their hearts. They were so sure that this story was for them and about them, so sure that they knew that Jesus had to be dealt with. When we hear the word of God speak to us on such a level that we know this message was for us, how do we handle it? Do we let the words penetrate our hearts so much that we turn and repent? Or do we ignore the truth, ignore his teachings, and try and stifle the sting we feel when we've heard the message? We must be truthfully aware of how we handle this. For how we handle this will guide our relationship with the Savior. The application and personalization points in this lesson are those points that may hurt, but we must realize that God uses parables to get these points across. Application number one, the vineyard owner matters. The vineyard owner matters. So what do we do about that? Give the vineyard owner the respect and the reverence that he deserves. He prepared it all for us. He gave it freely to us, and he is only asking for a small portion of it back. So why do we oppose him? Why do we turn against those that he sends on his behalf? Why can we be blind to his truth? Why do we fear the crowd and not speak up? Application number two. Our part in this matters. He prepared it all for us. He entrusted it all to us. How are we repaying him? We need to ensure that we are standing up for the truth. We need to ensure that we know the vineyard owner and his son and what they mean in this parable. We need to believe that this parable is for us not just the scribes and the elders and those that opposed Jesus and those that he were speaking to. We need to know that we know that we know that Christ was killed for us 
and willingly killed for us. As I was getting ready this morning, the song, I Raise a Hallelujah by Bethel Music came on. And I could just see Jesus saying some of these words to me. Sing a little louder in the presence of my enemies. Sing a little louder, louder than your unbelief. Sing a little louder, Amy. Don't stay quiet in front of the crowd. Sing a little louder. Application number three. Our loyalty to the vineyard owner matters. Who are we obeying? Who are we listening to? Are we willingly going where we are sent? Are we staying silent because of the crowd? When I discovered that the verb tense of sent was a fact, not a command, I had to stop for a minute. Yes, fact, the servants were sent, but he was not commanded to go. He was sent by the vineyard owner. The servant, knowing the vineyard owner well, went. This should hurt our hearts, folks. It stabbed mine. I know that I have not been loyal to the vineyard owner. If I cannot do the things he asks, how will I ever do the things that they command? I told you at the start that sometimes I can be bluntly honest. Well, here it is. We need to step up, step out, and stop wavering. Our loyalty should not change. It should not stop or diminish because we are asked or commanded, told or even whispered to do something. In closing, we cannot overlook the clear representation of God in Jesus in this parable. The scribes, the elders, the priests, those with hard hearts and blinders on, got it. And I believe that sometimes we can overlook the easiest concepts because we expect this to be hard. This parable is a clear representation of God sending his beloved son. God is the vineyard owner and the son he sends is Jesus. Knowing the outcome, he still sends his beloved son. God prepared a place for us and entrusted it to us. God sent his beloved son to us and we killed him. But luckily, it doesn't end there. Before we end, I want to stress the importance of our homework. It asks us every week to pray, to hear, to think, to talk, to share, and invite. Now, have I done this every week? No. Do I get more out of the lessons when I focus on God's word? Yes. Now, if you are asked to talk about the verses, if you are asked for your thoughts and opinions, please respond. I got to have a wonderful conversation with my Jay the other day regarding these verses. We talked <sighs> insight and meaning and how we can overlook the simple things. We talked love and obedience in Jesus, and I am beyond grateful for conversations like this with my kids. If you are asked to pray, please intently pray. Knowing that we have the support of our church family means a lot to teachers and to leaders and even the members. So I ask that you join me in being honest, that we may not live up to our homework duties every week, but going forward, we will make a strong and visible effort to pray, to hear, to think, to talk, to share and invite every week. We get to be in person next week. Imagine the impact that we will have on others, our church, our teacher, our families, and on ourselves if we decide that we won't stay silent because of the crowd. As a quick reminder, if you are attending Sunday School Live and in person next week, please let Jim know. You can comment on the Facebook post or leave a comment here or text him and let him know how many people will be with you. Thank you, friends. I am beyond happy that we get to be back in person next week. I hope to see you there. Thank you for allowing me the privilege to continue to teach on Mother's Day.
I enjoy this every time I get to stand before you. Grace and peace to you and God bless. And don't forget to sing a little louder. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks for engaging. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast, YouTube channel, and weekly email. You can subscribe to all three of those at OurSundaySchool.com. Grace and peace to you.